now I'm going to go. Uh, we're going to start the meeting with everyone's phone unmuted from our end. Uh, sometimes when we have large meetings, we like to mute everyone, but I really want this, and so does Brendan, want it to be more of an open discussion. So we're going to leave from, the, from our um, perspective as the controllers of the meeting, we want to leave uh, things unmuted. But if you would take care to mute and unmute your own phones, um, would you want to speak? Uh, and then mute them when you don't, when you're not speaking, and that way we won't have quite so much background noise, uh, so we can have a more focused meeting. So I would like to say thank you again for uh, showing up. A couple of things that um, I want to go over before we get into the Insight 79 uh, presentation. Um, first of all, I just want to thank a few people um, for, particularly Anders and Anil. Anybody else, Jim, that participated in the LinkedIn group that you remember? I think those were the... Oh, it was Mike that was managing it. Yeah, yeah. It was that's, a, that's all right, Grant. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Um, thank you guys for participating in the preview for Insight 7.9. Um, it was some good engagement that you showed there with Mike and appreciate. I think it was Anders that sent us some, some videos of some things that weren't working right. So we really appreciate that level of uh, support and help in helping us make a better product. So thanks a lot for that. Um, I also want to point out that if you're not a member of this LinkedIn group, um, you should be. Just You can shoot me an email. I think you all know my email address. If, if you don't, it's mark.walker at scribesoft.com. And um, you want to get yourself invited to that group because that's where we're going to run most of our MVP communication through. Based on the last meetings that we had in person in our office in the Netherlands, and then we had a meeting in Chicago uh, earlier this year, that was the consensus was to try to communicate uh, through a LinkedIn group. So that's, that's where we're running most of our communication. We're not going to be sending out a whole lot of emails or run most of it through this. So if you're not in the group, uh, please let me know and I'll get you invited to it. Uh, one thing I also uh, want to point out is that we do, if you hadn't heard yet, um, we made a change to the user conference. We originally, this year, we were planning on having a user conference in the September time frame. And after um, we sent out a survey to a number of people, um, I think we got a couple hundred, 150 or so responses on that. Um, it seemed like it was, it was trying to do too much too soon and we weren't going to have enough time to put quality presentations together to handle a couple days worth of user conference, nor were people's travel schedules going to allow for that in that time frame. So <clears throat> what we decided to do was to go on a world tour. And so we're going to still have a user conference. We're going to do it next year in the May time frame uh, in 2016. But this year, uh, we're going to do what we're calling a tech tour. So I want to show you a page we have on our website. Um, I'll, put, I'll, I'll, I'll open this up here so you can see what the URL for it is. So it's scribesoft.com slash 2015 slash, I mean, dash scribe dash tech dash tour. And um, you can go there to read about uh, the, what we're going to be doing on this tour. What, what we tried to do um, and based on feedback we've gotten from past events similar to this we did a couple of years ago, Brendan, I think you and I were involved in those in Chicago and New York, I don't yep. think we did in the other cities, was that people were really looking for technical content. And so what we've done is we've put together a general track and then you could diverge into a Scribe Online or a Scribe Inside track depending on um, which of the, um, which one that had more interest to you. Um, we are going to get good participation from uh, some of our executives and product management. I think you guys all know Pierre. He's a very knowledgeable person, great speaker. Same goes for Brendan. Uh, and Mike Bates, product manager, is going to be a number of these. Um, I'll show you quickly uh, where we're going to be. We're going to be in London in September. Um, I'll also note that that will also uh, have an MVP event related to it. So on September 11th, we're planning on having an MVP event. So the day after this London Tech Tour date, we're having another Scribe sponsor and repeat get together. Um, we'll be in San Francisco also in September, Boston in our backyard, uh, Reno, Nevada on October uh, 11th. On the day preceding that, October 10th, we're going to be doing a, another MVP meeting for the U.S.-based MVPs. So I just want to call those two specific days to your attention. Any of these, um, you're welcome to come to. We're actually looking for um, we still have a slot in there, Brendan, for a, um, yeah, for, um, we're doing some, like, we want to get some of you guys um, in one of your 
you know, ideally if you've got customers in the area that have an interest in you subscribe, um, could have a good story, we're going to look to kind of try to pull together a, um, not quite, you know, to a level of a case study, but have a customer presentation where they can get, you know, be part of the keynotes with like Sean and Lou um, and kind of walk through what the, the business problem was, how we solved it with Scribe, um, and really, you know, it's a standard, you know, front office, back office thing, that'd be, that'd be great, but if there's something unique about them, so if there was a unique challenge that we had to fit into, um, that's that's one of the things that we're um, striving to find. It's someone, you know, who's not just the, the standard GPC around template that get dropped and run. Um, something that a little, little outside the box would be uh, interesting. But yeah, we're going to be you guys will probably get approached by uh, myself or Lou or a couple others to see, you know, yeah. what you've got in the in the area. So if you have a good um, implementation story you'd like to tell uh, in front of our audience at the Tech Tour, we have some speaking slots available for partners. So we want to let you know about that. But as Brendan said, more information coming uh, by email at a later date. But I did want to let you know we're going to be doing this tour six different locations, including two in Europe, uh, four in the U.S., and then again. The MVP meetings will be in the U.S. on October 10th in Reno uh, and in London on September 11th. Uh, and then the la I think that's, that's about it for my prepared comments. Um, I, um, I don't think Brendan really needs a lot of introduction, so I don't want to just, I want to stop talking and let him go. Uh, and But what we wanted to do, there's been a number of other um, Seven nine inside seven nine meetings that we've done. Um, how many of those have you done so far, Brendan? Three so far. And how many were the same like webinar? You just did it multiple times, or were they all different? The the last two have been a little bit different. One okay. that we did the product launch one. And the last one was our deep dive. Um, and the deep dive content kind of got into some of this. Okay. Um, but yeah, this, but this will be the this is much more discussion, right. and open ended, and talking about what we've seen, um, yep. getting questions. And those guys. those meetings, um, if you missed them, we do. They're recorded. We always make recordings of those. So you can go back and take a look at those. Do we have any others scheduled? Or are they, they're all done? Okay. All done. So this will really be the last one. And we wanted to give you, the MVPs, an opportunity to talk to our product expert here. Um, and we could go into a little more detail. And like Brenda said, have more of a discussion. The way we run those other webinars, you know, they're more of a presentation that we do. We do a and a session, but it's not open mic. It's Everything is done through the chat window. So we wanted to have a more open discussion. We have prepared a couple of areas. Brendan and I talked it over, and we planned a few different areas that we thought we might dive into. So, Brendan, I'm going to um, turn the the presentation um, over to you, okay. and maybe you can take us through that agenda. Yeah, we had, and Anil had a question about the um, the dates. Um, yeah, that like the the October one in, in Reno is on a Sunday, and it is actually because it's it's going around. I think CRMUG yeah. is that same week, so we're trying to fit these things in like when we know people will be in the area anyway. Um, so some of them I think are, is that the only one on the weekend or is another one? I will have to check the calendar. I'll let yeah, you but we know that was, I had the same kind of reaction. I'm like, wait, that's not the. Yeah, and that's the way it worked out. We, we, we had a choice. Um, we could have scheduled them in different places, but we, we ganged up the tech tour meetings on the tail end or the front end of some, some of other industry events that were going on like CRM user group and extreme CRM. And so we, by adding an MVP meeting at the same time, we had to pick a day at the beginning or the end. In some cases, it came out being on a weekend. So, sorry about that. That's the best we thought we could do to save people extra travel. Um, if we're talking about, what were the, uh, hang on, let me go to those dates. Was like, yeah, the 10th to 14th. I think those September are. 11th is a Friday, and October 10th is a Saturday. So that's, that's the MVP thing will be Saturday, and then the Scribe Tech Tour thing will be the Sunday, and then yeah. I think CRMUG kicks off. Cause I, I, I'm pretty sure that they do the um, the day ahead, like the day that the Scribe event's going to be. I think they do training as well. I believe for CRMUG, they do like a, a precursor. Well, in the, I know for the London event, we're planning on doing a level two training there, but I don't think any MVPs would want to go to that. Although you could if you wanted a refresher. Yeah. But All right. All right, so yeah, so um, so for the stuff we're talking about today, um, we put this little agenda out there on the LinkedIn group before. A lot of it's around connections, so I'm going to walk through a little bit more, like, you know, it, what the connections actually do, how you should manage them. Um, the other thing we're going to do is going to walk you through the release notes. Mike and his team did a really good job of um, through the QA process of the upgrade. So 
we actually slipped the date on this to because we ran into a couple of quirks on the upgrade, yep. and we made sure we worked. We changed a couple of product features, so like that cascade connection stuff, that was all redone for this. Um, so that was you know one of the reasons why the date had slipped at one point for this because we wanted to make sure that when you did the upgrade, you know it didn't it wasn't a breaking upgrade that it wasn't going to cause any issues. But we also documented that process. So I'll walk you through both you know what the connection UI looks like, how to work with it what pieces are stored in the database, what's stored outside the DTS, um, go through the release notes. And then the other thing that I've gotten a lot of feedback in the last two meetings about, um, you know, multi-threading, threat awareness, duplications. So I actually am going to show you a, a prepared example. I'm going to, you know, I'll probably run this thing a couple times, but it will create a couple duplicates. And then I'll show you how to fix it with one of the product features to add threat awareness. Um, as we do more multi-threading, I think you'll see some more product features will come out around threat awareness, so how to know that you've already gotten this message in another another parallel thread. But for the time being, I'll kind of highlight like what we can do for a little threat awareness there. So let's jump out and let's go into Workbench. All right, so the biggest thing is that, you know, when you open this up, you're not going to see any, there's no big glaring changes. You know, you go to your connection screen, when you first open up, it'll have just that same Scrap Internal database. Um, so that's the only you know preloaded st stored connection. You'll see here though, I've got a bunch that I've been adding over time. So this UI will start to fill up as you create unique connections. What you see here, this is representative of what's stored in the database as well. So these are the connection details, things like URLs, um, username, password, that basic information on how to connect. Those are the things that are going to be stored inside the database. And you can see here, this is a view of what, you know, connections are actually there. This is not, a, when you first do the upgrade, this is not going to get pre-populated with absolutely everything you've got. You know, this is going to be the first step of a process we're going to go through and, um, and make these changes. So if you go to the release notes and you scroll down through them a little bit, you know, pass all the details, we actually have this whole upgrade process. So the first part of it is pretty standard. This is what we always have. You know, if you've got a lot of data, you want to make sure you get rid of it. You have to deinstall some up, um, adapters, uninstall them before you do this next process. But below, you've got this whole before you convert section. So this is where you should really start to pay attention because the things like, you know, setting up a naming convention. If I have 15 different, you know, connections named source across 15 different DTSs, and I don't go through and make a change, you're going to see down here, you're going to get these source one, source two, source three. It's not going to be something that's going to make a lot of sense to you. So what you can do is before you go through the upgrade process, if you start to kind of work through your DTSs, you know, even have like an Excel sheet, just have something to say, okay, every CRM connection, I want named this. Because what will happen is once you do that, that cascade, if you've got the connections named the same, if they have the same connection details inside of them, um, the properties are the same, then they'll be able to use that same connection. So there is a capability that if you kind of do a little pre-work of making sure that, you know, get the names consistent, make sure the connection properties are the same, so don't use, you know, like the IP and the, the DNS name for CRM. Use one consistent, um, you know, connection parameter. You can make this upgrade process a little bit easier because that cascade will go through and it will readjust the DTS that sit underneath it. So that's one of the first big things is, you know, pick a naming convention and stick with it because these naming conventions are stored in the DTS um, and then they have a pointer to the database. So like if I add my Salesforce connection here, so I'll double click that guy and I want to go to here and add that connection so I can add connections into context. So once I do this, I add that connection to Salesforce. It'll come up and I'll have that connection in context. I can add multiple connections here. So just like we could do before, yeah, I want to add multiple different types. I'll grab my SQL. You know, it's the same interface as you had before with multi-target. It's just a different kind of way that you don't have to create a connection inside the DTS. This DTS now becomes pointer. So if you kind of think about it like in CRM terms, it's like the activity party, um, activity pointers. You know, these things are not going to have a lot of information in the DTS file, but it's going to have, you know, pointing it out to the scribe database where all the stuff lives. So you're recommending that 
clean up your connection names yeah. before you even attempt the upgrade. Yeah, it'll make your it'll make because, your life easier because there's probably some leftover stuff in there where the connection name is source. Right, source or target, target, target. Exactly. That can make a lot of sense when you do the upgrade. And then you've got all this stuff in your database, source one, source two, source three, and you don't even know what it is. Right, and then you'll have to go out afterwards, and you'll have, you know, you'll have a list of source one, source two, source three as stored connections. And then you got to go, and then you got to start doing a bunch of, of actual manual repointing. So doing it up front means you're going to let the DTS upgrade process um, do a lot more of the work versus if I had, you know, 15 different sources and I want to consolidate it later on in time, I have to go to each TTS, I have to change the connection from using that old one to the, you know, source number three. Right. I do that across all the DTSs, then I got to go back and delete connections from my, my connection manager. So it's really just, a, it's purely, it won't break anything if you don't do this. This is just kind of like your best practice. This will make the upgrades easier. And this is a one-time thing, you know. So once you upgrade to 7.9 and you've got this thing done right, when you upgrade to 8.0 or not, whatever's going to come after the fact, this isn't a process you have to go through again. You know, this is the, the one big change that you have to accommodate. Now, for. one of the things that I don't know if you had it in your list to talk about, but it's something I thought was interesting was that you can, I think one of our design principles for the 7.9 was that we wanted to make the DTSs run even if you didn't open them. Right. So you don't necessarily have to open them after the, right after the upgrade. They, they, can, they can run on their own without you touching them. Yeah. Yeah, and that's where I was going to highlight this. So only when you um, when you start this process, Scrabble will go through and start touching DTSs. If you don't do anything, so if I upgraded this installation 7.9 and I didn't touch it after that, I simply did the upgrade process, things are still going to run. My database is going to have nothing in it. So that database, let's see, let's open up my data view here. So it's a table called data providers, it's a brand new table added to the Scrab internal database, and this is what's going to contain that, um, that connection information. When you do the upgrade, you know, it doesn't, again, it won't try to, like, backfill this table with a bunch of information. You have to initiate the process by opening up the workbench, opening up a DTS, and then allowing it to do some of the cascading that it will do. Um, but then once you start doing that process, you can start seeing data get written into this table. And when you look at it, it's got things like, you know, a unique identifier for that connection, what type of connector it is, the name of that connection that you're storing that's displaying in the connection manager, username, password, server creds, connection parameters. So all these different pieces that you need to, like, it needs to know on how to connect to these different endpoints, you'll see that sort of get added into this database. But you don't, when you first do the upgrade, you'll see this thing only have, you know, the one, like, scribe internal connection in here. It's not going to have every single connection that you've ever had on your, your scribe installation, it's going to make you do a little bit of, of work to get those to start to populate. It only puts them in there once you open a DTS with that connection. Once you do the DTS and then, um, and then all the cascades of the DTS specific, so yep. it's really when you open the DTS, that's when you see things start to pop into that, that okay. connection manager into this table. Right. So you can see like the stuff that's stored in the database, it's pretty basic. It's, it's username, password, connection details, you know, what connection, what adapter is being used. Um, not a lot of really interesting stuff going on in here. And that's where the more interesting stuff is still sort of the DTS. Can I ask a question that you might not know the answer to? Yeah. All right. That password you're showing there, that's encrypted. Yeah. Same old way we used to encrypt them with some key that's based on the system ID. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, it's, it's the same scribe crypto key. So it's okay. like when you go to, if I went to the casing table, I can't see all the, right. you know, okay. the server information. Yep. So yeah, yeah, that's a, it's a good note that the passwords are, are obviously still encrypted. So it's like, this is the same encryption that you saw. If you open up a DTS and DTS edit, it's the same exact, you know, encryption keys that we're using. All right, we haven't changed that. No, no. Okay. So um, what's actually stored in the DTS? So let's open up some connection. And I'll add, let's see, MySQL's not that sexy, so let's throw in, let's just use Salesforce because I know it's got, it's got other parameters I can play with. So when I add that to the DTS, if I go ahead and I just save this guy, what you see is that behind the scenes, go out to our documents, scribe, collab, default, to 
long way to get to DTS Edit, but and that's the other thing. I mean, you can still open it with DTS Edit. I can, I can crack it open because it's XML now, but I just like, you know, I like my little tool. Come on. There we go. All right, so back here, you still got under data providers. It'll still store some of this information. So like XML, all that stuff's stored within here, um, the basics. But you can see that you've got inside of this, you've got your, your same you know, password. So the creds are stored in here um, within the DTS. They're also stored within the, the um, Scribe database. So this is not that it's like, it's not going to leverage one or the other. They're allowing you to have a pointer back to that unique connection inside the database so that you can allow it to use across the board. It doesn't take the place of the connections inside of, of the DTS. Reason being is that this connection is going to have a lot more information than just what the database stores. So if I wanted to add parameters around this connection, so I want to go in here and I'm going to change adapter settings. So this is going to be, I want to change the default to a specific user um, within here. If I want to use the run as user for, for dynamics, it's going to allow me to make these changes. These changes are going to be specific to this one DTS. So you can see when you come into this, it does tell you that these are adapter specific settings for this DTS. These are all things around this one DTS using this connection. This is not going to cascade to all the other connections. So that's why we have this stuff stored in two places, is that now you can have some of these query, these um, adapter properties are going to be around what this one DTS is going to do, not globally. If I still want to change the username globally, I change that back in the connection parameter, and it cascades to all the different DTSs using it. Um, it's not, again, I don't have to use the cascade. I don't have to do anything else. This knows to fetch the latest information um, what it needs to connect because of the GUIs that are associated with the database. So it's a long way to say, basically, that most things are stored in the database, but the connection properties, the little specific things around, you know, upsert or run as user, that stuff's still stored only in the, uh, the DTS file. So I'll save that guy. So yeah, I definitely I recommend um, read through the release notes specifically around the conversion because this whole beginning part is all around connections, um, working with the import export, when things match, when things don't. Yeah, we spent a lot of time doing this. The good thing is we haven't heard out in the wild any of the issues that we had encountered in our QA process. So it seems like with this doc and with the changes we made to the cascade that we caught pretty much everything that we had seen. Um, that doesn't mean that there's not something else that we haven't anticipated or we haven't come across yet, but the combination of the product changes and this um, individual upgrade process, I think has pretty much covered, you know, the basis for us. Yeah, and if you come across something that's you don't think is right or that's not working right, I'm sure you know how to get in touch with our tech support, but we definitely want to know about that because I've asked our um, tech writer to meet with our uh, tech support team every week so in case there's anything that we're mm -hmm. learning through tech support by customers and partners using the 7.9 product that we need to improve in the documentation, we've got that line of communication open. So those, those tech support and the tech writing team meet every week anyway uh, for that specific purpose. So if you have something you want to float up uh, through that process, just uh, get in touch with support. Let them know you found something weird about 7.9. Yeah. Yeah. And even if it's just that we said it does one thing and it does something that's slightly different, you know, it's better for us to document it than, than not. So you want to you move on to the next section? I was, yeah, I was going to say, do you guys have questions yeah. around connections? Just because I know it's it's a weird feature because it doesn't really, it's a big change, but it's not a big change. You know, it's just like yeah. we're, we're storing connections in a little bit different of in a way in a different area, um, but it doesn't have a huge impact on, you know, upcoming designs. But I definitely, if you have questions that, that you had and didn't get answered, um, give me a shout. Let me know. Brendan, I've got a question about moving to production. Yep. Um, so I understand how this, I can see how this works now. Um, we, uh, or most of my clients, have a Scribe server that's entirely separate for production. So we do all, all, all our development against one Scribe server with one Scribe database, Scribe internal database, I should say. And then we'll move the jobs to production. So I'm um, under the assumption that, 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 that I can see the Scribe connections are stored in the uh, 
Skype internal database. So what's the process for migrating um, connections from dev to production? Can I just move the DTS to production server and it'll just work? Or do I need to populate that um, adapters table in the production Scribe internal with the connections with my jobs? No, I would do, um, so when you move the DTS over, when it's, it's opening up inside that production server, you know, it's going to have this connection to the new Scribe internal database. So it'll kind of go through the same, you think about a quote unquote upgrade process as the, as your other DTSs, where if it doesn't find that connection already, it's going to create a new, a new connection, new GUID inside of there. Um, the better process though will probably be, and I, I don't know how well we got documented this inside of here, um, with the import export. So that probably is the better way because what that will allow you to do is that will allow it to, to put the connections in. It can update additional parameters if they're there. Um, so that way it's not just a DTS, you know, that does, that import process changes the database settings. That might be the better way to do it because it's going to associate it with that connection with all the DTS underneath it because it already has that, that one to many relationship. Um, so that could be one way. The other thing you could do, depending upon, you know, the way that this, this works with the different environments that you have, um, we could look at the naming conventions and it could just be that we could, you could hack the database a little bit, you know, because the, the only thing I, I would hesitate is because the IDs are stored within there. So they're, you know, these GUIDs are pointing back to specific DTSs. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't jump down that, but um, depending on what you kind of see from it, you know, whether the, if just dropping a DTS is going to cause too much effort with the cascade doesn't work properly, or if the import process doesn't do exactly what we want to do, there might be a third option of, of kind of like you said, dropping things in place. But it's just I get I get hesitant with uh, with hack with you know inserting stuff into the database when we have GUIs involved. So probably importing is the op best option to start Usually, with. Usually, yeah. And, so, but you could also try just copying the DTS over and open it and. The way that it works is that it will check the internal database to see if that connection exists there, and if it doesn't, it'll add it. Right. The only thing I don't know what would happen though is if it's if the connection because obviously your your test and production servers are going to have a different connection parameter. So what I'm I'm worried about though is that what that would do is create a new connection under the covers, seeing it as a you know, development connection. So I'd have to check that specifically. Okay. Um, but there might you know with the cascade, what might happen too is that if you make the change in one area it should cascade down to all the other TTSs. And that's where the beam port extra process does that inherently. It does a lot more of the repointing. Um, so yeah, so it's a very long answer for a short, a short response. I would use the import export for okay. moving the DTSs um, because you can do files and connections only. You don't have to import export integration processes. Um, you can select just the DTSs and that might be an easier way to, to manage the connections. Um, because then, and that doesn't really have much application to the, the whole outside connection manager piece. It's just another way to, to kind of rejigger the connections on import to a new system. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Good question. All right. All right. All right. So next? next thing is multi-threading. So this really has been like the, the beehive of activity. Um, because as you guys know now, you know, you can see in here, I've got time, file, query integration. They can all run in parallel to one another. So with, what that means is basically like you guys have already figured out, you now have to worry more about threat awareness with this. It adds a lot of really good capability where I can stand up, you know, five time integration processes. I can run them all at the same time in parallel. They don't have to wait behind one another. So if one of them takes an hour and one of them takes a minute, they can both run at the same time. I don't have to wait an hour for the minute one to run. So that's, that's the biggest reason why we did this. Uh, what's come up and out of it, though, is that now there's a couple of issues where, you know, theoretically, you could run the same integration twice in a row. So it could be kicking off once and then kicking off another time, and you'll have two integrations running in parallel that never should have. They never knew that they were going to before. Um, the biggest things that we're, we're trying to you know, educate about is knowing how you, how long a DTS run, make sure you're scheduling it so that it really shouldn't be a feature that's allowing you to run DTSs, the same DTS in parallel when they're not queue-based. The reason we allow queue-based integrations to run in parallel is because it's going to be transactional. It's going to be a single XML message that needs to get processed through. And 
in theory, when things are all working the way that they, they on paper should, there should not be that same message in memory anywhere else. So I know that that does happen. We're going to address that in a couple minutes. I'll show you some examples. But really, the biggest the idea behind this feature is that it's running different integrations of those three types at the same time. So if I may interrupt for a sec, um, Anders had a question yeah. about whether this capability was available in all editions, and it is. Yeah, the multi-threading is. Um, the thing that's not, we'll talk about the process of grouping, but what you'll see is when you when you do a scribe installation for anything, you know, SM, SB15 up through Enterprise, you'll have two processor groups. They'll have serial and default. So the two things in caps here. Serial is going to be the default choice when I you know, time, file, query. That group defaults to, to serial. When I pick Q, it changes to default. So you guys should just understand that that's basically default means I've got multiple message processors. Serial means we're going to run it, you know, one at a time. When I change that, I'm going to get a pop-up. It's going to tell me that if I assign this to a group other than serial, it'll force it to run synchronously. So it'll run all this data at the same time. So it does give you some pop-ups and stuff, but, you know, those are the two groups that every scribe installation will see is serial and, uh, and default, and that's the behavior. Serial runs a serial integration, one after the next after the next. Default is going to allow it to run data um, in parallel across multiple integration types. So uh, just as a follow-up to Andre's question, there is another feature you're going to talk about later, which yeah. is the message processor grouping, yeah. and that is something that's restricted to enterprise enterprise licenses, yeah. just to be clear. But this feature with yeah, multi-threading where, multi where file time and query can all run simultaneously, that's available to every edition of the product. Yeah. So a couple things you got to think about now, um, it twofold. For any of these integrations that are going to now run in parallel, you know, uh, Don Panic had a question on the group about, you know, file integration. So what you'll see is when you pick a file integration type and a default processor group, we don't default the obtain a lock on the file before processing. It doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Like, in this case, we can lock it, we can not. If you have a second integration that's going to try to access that file while the first one's running, it's going to get a rejected message because it, it can't access it. The DTS is going to have that, that file open. So this was really important about, you know, having other systems that might be working with the file. If I have an outside process creating it, I don't want Scribe to try to grab it while it's still being fed in. I also don't want that process to try to feed data into it while Scribe's already working on it. So it's going to create a unique lock on it. This before processing is an important word because it, I don't think people always understand what it meant. When we pick up that file, the event manager is what notices that file. So that service is what goes out and says, hey, I've got this file. It's, a, you know, asterisk.csv. It's 5000.csv. That event manager is then going to feed it into a message processor. What can happen between here, though, is that I might have pre-processing commands that I need to have occurring. Um, I might have other processes in place that are looking for this thing or, or running it in different manners. So that lock is done before the DTS gets its hand on the file. Once the DTS opens the file, it's going to lock it anyways. So this, this obtain a lock process, it's not the most important um, critical piece of, of information anymore because of the way that we run this with multi-threading. You do need to be aware, though, that if I have this guy running, you know, every second and it's going to try to pick up files, I'm going to cause a lot of alert chatter because it's going to have locks, it's going to get rejected, it's going to have issues. So I want to make sure when I build these integrations, I know that they can run in multiple threads now. I want to ensure that I'm timing this thing in a way that it's not going to just, you know, it's not going to try to pick up the same file over and over and over and over again because it's on multiple threads and doesn't realize that there's other things going on because it will cause issues down the line. So if I know this job takes, you know, a minute to run, then maybe I'll have this thing checking every 300 seconds. So, you know, every five minutes, go look for a new file. When it picks it up, it runs it. It just allows me to have a little more security over this, a um, little, more, little more capability once the job's running. Once the job's out of this event directory, you know, once the, the process actually has it up, as you guys probably, you, well, you, may, you probably know this, but like, Scribe tracks the name of the file and the timestamp of the file. So once we know we've got it, we're not going to 
it's not going to trigger another event. There's just that weird in-between time where we don't quite know that we've gotten it yet. It hasn't kicked the DTS off yet. There is no entry in the execution log for it. Um, there's, a, there's a gray period now of, of how we run this because we run them in parallel that you could get bit by. So basically, it's really a, it's a long-winded way of saying, you know, <laughs> make your timing correct. You know, if you've got a job that, that takes 15 seconds, don't have it checking every second. Um, be a little more liberal with it because it's going to allow you to eliminate errors. It won't stop the job from running. It will still run through properly. You'll get the job to be processed, but you might raise an alert when you don't need to. So it's, it's thinking about how to process these files in a way that's not going to create more headache for you down the line. What we're doing under the covers um, with this, we're actually, realistically, we didn't really make a huge change for this, this um, feature. What we're doing is each one of these, these default processor groups, they're actually kind of converting this to a queue-based integration behind the scenes under the covers. So when I trigger one of these, so let's take this guy, um, let's see if I've got that. Put this file back in here. All right, that's where it needs to be. Um, if I run this guy right now, it's going to find that file. And what I'm going to see is in the scribe in queue, here's an XML message with not real details in it. It's just the information about the actual job and what it needs to do. It's like a, a query off the Scrap Internal database that produced one XML. This XML is going to trigger that file integration, which is going to allow me to run that thing in multiple threads. So you could have done this in the past. This is nothing that we are, are you know, groundbreaking innovation here. Um, I could have made a query publisher that pushed a message into the Scribe in queue and triggered a file, you know, a, a job that read from a file or a job that read from a DT, uh, a, table that had a you know, query. Um, the standard way of using queue-based integrations is that you feed the XML in as a dynamic source. It's not the only way you had to do it. You're using that XML as a trigger. That's exactly what we're doing here is we're making it much, much, much easier to do a process you could have done in the past. Same way as we're making it easier to use the performance benefits of bulk and batch load and fast load. You know, these are things you could have spun up yourself. You could have run workbenches in parallel in memory. Um, we're just trying to make it a lot simpler so that you can design a job much more easily to kind of do the things you want it to do to perform the way you want it to perform versus having to having get really creative and think outside the box. So what we've got, though, is I've heard, you know, again, we've heard this a bunch so far, is this is the, the DTS I have here. So lead must equal to. Uh, pretty standard design. Look it up on email. Insert it if you don't find it, update it if you do. And I just happened, I know not everyone uses key cross, but I'm going to use it in this example because of what I, I wanted to do. I could very easily just pass in, you know, the value I found from the seek. I could use a target variable to pass that in. But the idea here, here is that you want to, whatever you found in that, that seek, whatever you found up ahead of time, you want to use that on the subsequent update because you spent the effort to look for it anyways. You might as well do something with it. So it's using a standard key cross reference, um, nothing exciting, nothing, nothing crazy. So what I'm going to do is I've got that set up as an integration process. I can see in here right now it's got that one, yeah, that file integration sitting there. But I store a whole bunch of data that I want to process. So I've got nothing in my key cross table. And I've got no data inside that, that MySQL database. So I'm going to go ahead and just paste in all that data. So let's try that again. Grab all these guys. Paste them in here. And I might have to run this once or twice just to get it to, to reproduce the issue. Um, but basically, you know, I've got 100 messages I need to get processed. Scribe's going to pick them up and push them into that MySQL database. It's going to do the, the lookup, insert or update based upon what it found. There we go. Now they're coming out. 60, 30, 18, gone. 
So my key cross reference table has been populated. So I've got my email as my key. I've got my GUID as my key. I'll check in here. All right, so I've got the one. So now that the connections are open, let's see if we can reproduce this. So I'm going to go ahead and remove these couple of pieces. I can see I've got a bunch of connections open. So when I run this the second time, it's going to run a whole lot faster. So I'm going to copy and paste. So I got 100 messages in, and I've got 100 messages out. So the, the upfront was all the connections. So it spun up a bunch of connections. It made them into there. I've still got only the one key cross um, reference. But if I look in here, ah, I should still do one more time. Do one more time, and then I'll, I'll stop trying to illustrate the point. Um, but basically, what I'm trying to do is emulate what you guys have seen, where if I just let this stuff run in parallel, I let things just happen as they will, that what will have happen is that that lookup, that seek, is going to find nothing there and do the insert. Well, I've got another thread in parallel um, doing the same thing. So let's just do this one more time, see if I can't reduce that. Damn. Well, sorry, this was Took me a while to try to reproduce, but it's, yeah, it's, it's playfully. But, yeah, so basically what can happen, though, is that you saw how fast that data came out. Um, it does eventually, if I run this a couple more times, it probably will create a couple of duplicates in here. Um, it's using a natural key matching. It's running in parallel. It's just a, a happenstance that it, it can happen. This can happen in real life. The, the duplicates. The duplicates, yeah. So creating duplicates inside of here. Okay. The way that you change that is really, really simple, is using the key cross reference block. So this is a feature that's been around for a long time. Um, all it does is create threat awareness. So all I have to do is change this from using the look lookup, add the word lock in here, save that add guy. Function does a different thing when it hits the key cross reference table because it locks the table. Yeah, it creates a, a whole a lock process. So, so one one process that's running and it, the first one to hit that function will lock the key cross reference table so nobody else can touch it. Yeah, exactly. Um, another thing so you guys know, whenever you make a change to a DTS, um, if there's a message processor in memory, it won't it doesn't go pull the new copy of the DTS. It keeps the old copy. So that old copy is in memory. So that, that's why I had to do that. It's just I had all those threads open. Now I have no threads open. Um, so making sure it's going to use the new DTS. Same process. I'll go through and delete key cross. I'll go through and remove the data from here. So I got nothing. And I'll do that same. I'll do the copy paste. Now, the only thing you're going to really notice is I'm going to I'll run this a couple times. Obviously, I didn't get it to create the duplicates this time, but I, you guys all know that it would. Um, you guys are seeing this more than I am in real life. But what you're going to what you should notice here is that it's going to slow way down on the speed by which it moves the data out of here. So I'm just going to do the same thing and keep refreshing. You can see now it's doing you know 95. Now I'm down into the 80s. So before, even that first run, this took a couple seconds. You know, each process took less than a second. This is taking significantly longer because what's happening is that each thread that's running this guy is putting locks on the table until it finishes when the next thread can then pick it up. So there's a lot of, there's a ton of chatter that happens with this, but the end result is the same thing. You get, you only have one record in your key cross table and you'd only have one record inside that target system. This would be a lot more effective of a, you know, bad trick if I could get that, the duplicates to create. I'll, um, but we believe that it does happen. Error does happen. You know, it definitely does happen. So this is the only feature that we have today in the product that uh, creates threat awareness. So that lock feature is the only thing that we've got that allows you to have one thread know what the next thread is doing by doing some, some unique locking and, and releasing on our described database. So, so if you're not using so if you're not using cross-reference, you, you should watch out for 
threads may be stepping on each yeah. other. Yeah, and this is a reason, yeah. you know, realistically, you know, we, we used to talk a lot about how Keypros is great and source, you know, you can store the stuff locally. It really doesn't matter if you don't even use this thing for, for the way I have it built in. As long as you have this formula and this feature turned on, you'll get the locking capability. So you could use it in a calculated variable and never leverage it inside of a DTS. It's just going to produce a lock on the table when it needs to. So it's not something you have to change the design for. You just have to use that combination of features. So you're, are you, so you're saying that, I never thought of that before. You're saying that mm -hmm. you could use that extra lookup lock feature even if you're not using key cross reference, just as a way to make the multiple processes that are running simultaneously exactly. not step on each other and create duplicates. Exactly, okay. exactly. And that's where it becomes get that point. much more important. You know, and this is really much handier. Um, it's very handy for Q-based integrations, but the same process applies. The same locking process happens with multiple rows of data in our source. So if this was a query-based integration, if this was time-based integration that was running in parallel, you could use the locking even if, like I said, you, you, don't, you don't have to go back and change your design to change your lookups and add a, a lookup link using that, you know, XREF lookup stuff. It's just, I built it this way because this is how I'm used to it. Um, but I, I just have to have the, the formula being used inside that DTF, inside that row of data to produce the lock that I want. So it's a really, it's a very simple thing to add. Um, you don't have to make a huge, massive change to your design of your DTSs, and it is the only way that we have to create threat awareness without just chewing up a ton of, of errors. So, like when I was testing this earlier, let's see if I've got bring this up here. Um, so you can see if I go down a ways that I've actually got a bunch of runs that I did where I created a, a primary key constraint and I was pushing data in and it would create, two, there we go, all these row failures. So this is another way obviously where I want, you know, I could create my own, my own way of managing this thing, but I'm going to produce a row failure when I do it that way. So it's a primary key constraint, something I'm adding into a DTS. When I do it with the locking, it's not a failure. It's simply waiting in memory. So it's going to kind of, you know, give it the extra second it needs to come back in afterwards and do the update instead of the insert. So it's really not a massive amount of, of effort you have to put in here. Um, it's built in. You don't have to try to roll your own. You know, you could get kind of creative with how to do this outside of it, but this is the easiest way. And it's really, it's really tough that the easy workaround's been for years just to crank the message processors down. So you can still do that if you want. You can come to properties. You could drag this down to, to two. You'd have one thread for default. You have one thread for serial. But this way, it's a lot easier to, you know, build a little bit of threat awareness into your DTSs um, using that feature. So I'm going to pause for a second here. Do um, you guys have any comments or questions about that? Um, any other threading issues you guys have either encountered or you're anticipating? Hey, Brandon, this is Neil. Hey, Neil. Hey, how are you? Good, um, good, good. So. So we've um, we faced this issue with uh, uh, you know with our integrations where we use a lot of queue-based integration, mm -hmm. and um, you know we thought that um, in a lot of those cases um, you know the um, what do you call it? the uh, grouping of processors you know might might resolve our issue with um, sort of this duplication when you know there is one time when some duplicate might come in. But I think um, using what you just showed, which we have not used, by the way, the key cross from the table, m would would help us prevent those uh, dupes when um, our source system is generating, for whatever reason, uh, duplicate XMLs. Yeah, and that's we do see. I mean, especially things like um, you know, things like NAV. You know, when you're when you're tabbing through fields, they're actually doing database saves behind the scenes. Like our publisher. Yeah doesn't do a really great job of discriminating that. If you look at the pub table especially, like we try to do the, the slow roll and pick one at a time, but you can still get data out like that. And there's other systems that do the same thing where it's a constant updating process. So it's, you get a lot of these systems which are pretty chatty. And, um, and you're right though, Neil, like you could actually, the grouping feature, I'll, I'll talk about it in a second too, but like, but you could use that. If you knew you had one particular integration that was just super chatty, it did this all the time and you didn't, 
you said, I just want to put that one on a single thread, that grouping feature would come in handy for that. Um, this is much more like a, an overarching, if I want to just have multi-threading capability and I want everything to work well enough with each other, it's a little feature you can add in there without a lot of ton of overhead, not a ton of, of work um, to allow that, that awareness to happen. Cor correct. And, and you know, with uh, multi-threading is very useful because if I were to put this in a, you know, um, in a group with a in kind of like a, with a single processor, um, uh, typically you can only do that for very low volume transactions. So if you're generating a lot of sales orders, you couldn't, you want the multi-threading. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you definitely you're limiting yourself by by doing that. But at least the only good thing is with the way that this new feature works, that grouping feature. Um, again, this is I mean it's only enterprise, but it's it's a good feature for that because if I have you know I have my total number of threads, I've got 25 totally available to me. I got 16 for my default. I've got one for serial, and then I've got you know seven for this guy. I can add another group, and let's call them Jatterish. And I can just give it, you know, one processor. It goes and creates a new, a new scribing, uh, you know, scribing queue, a new input queue for that particular group. Um, so it keeps it dedicated from the others. But then I can apply this to, you know, one or just a couple of integrations that that have that chatter capability, where it's just, you know, it's easier for me to just throw it into one single thread because I don't care. It's not a high volume. It's just going to do what it needs right. to do. It can be queue based, but I can let it just rip through it. Um, this is a nice way to do that, where I can dedicate things across. The the one danger with this, though, is if I get too crazy with dedicating different threads across, so, like, you know, I, I start moving all these processes across, the default is going to be the default behavior for any kind of multi-threaded integration. Um, these threads are available for anything coming into this group. These other threads are no longer available to this group. So as many as you assign in this window, that's the max that it's going to get. So if I were to go through and like change, for whatever reason, I can't change the default one, um, change my total number down to whatever, I uh, can't do math, but like something lower. <laughs> what will happen is you see here the default, default got sucked away, got two taken away. So it's no longer 17, it's 15. Let's bring that down another one, it got 13. So whenever I make these changes, I'm taking processes away from the default behavior of scribe because this one, this one, this seven, no other group could ever use those processors. They are purely dedicated to that dedicated one. That specific yeah. group. So there can, you can cause, you know, if you don't think about that, you could actually slow down other, you know, default behaviors of scribe by, by doing too much with the grouping because if you only get that message, you know, once a month, that thread's still not going anywhere. It's waiting for that once a month you, message you, you to come through. You that message processor. Exactly. Or anything else. Exactly. So this feature is pretty cool for, for doing the grouping, um, for, you know, you can isolate integration, you can kind of dedicate these different threads, you can create direct routes between systems, but there, there certainly is an inherent risk with getting too crazy with, with dedicating processors because you only have so many to deal with, and everything you put into a group, only that one group can touch. Do you have a couple like use cases you could share about why you why you would use groups or yeah I mean the two the two are the biggest one is like what Anil said so yeah. if you've got like um, think about this for example so I used this in the other meeting but it, I think it's a good example because it's what I dealt with in support a bunch yeah. if I've got an aging process so at the end of the month I'm going to age or at the end of the year age all my invoices okay. I'm going to go through it's going to be a batch update so let's let's say two million records. What would happen in the past is that if I used just straight message queuing default integration types, then it would flood my queue with two million messages, right. and then every thread would be available to using just that. Because the way that the processes work is right. they, you know, hold in context. They want to, right. They want to do what they want to do. So it'll spin up a whole bunch of message processes that'll all be occupied using doing that one. Thing exactly. Right. So now if I have accounts come in, if I have right. orders come in, that's all oh, waiting going on. Exactly. Yeah. I can use a group to just say dedicate to this aging process. So it's going to look for it. It's only going to happen once a year, once a month. And I'm going to run it through just one processor. Like, screw it. You know, you guys, you're going to flood the queue. You're going to run through just this data. Um, I don't want you impacting the rest of my business. So right. that's one use case of kind of isolating it. Yep. Um, the other is is making sure you've got paths open. So, like, we have the whole, you know, parents coming in after children. We have that kind of issue yeah. that's occurred in the past. Yeah. I always have four message processors open for an account to come through. 
because that account and, and order might come through about the same time. I want to ensure the account can get in as fast as possible. Fast lane concept. Yeah. So it's, it's basically, yeah, it's, you have fast lane and you have a slow lane. Those are the two big reasons that we've dreamt up lately yeah. of the groupings that I want to, I want to keep something from consuming too much or I want to make sure some new systems are always available for this type of integration. Okay. And I'm sure yeah, you guys have come up with a lot more and a lot more interesting ones than, than we are, but at least that was kind of like the thought process of being able to ensure you've got, you either have resources available um, for specific integrations or you're making sure those integrations aren't consuming too many of the other resources. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, yeah, so I know that's why we're at. We're up at the we're, hour. We're but. about we're about at the hour mark. How are you uh, getting through your your uh, the agenda? I have probably missed one or two things, but I think that I got the pieces I wanted to. Um, I'm gonna do another a blog post, guys, about that that key cross reference thing uh, with some more details, and I'll probably have a little more. I'll have some more information around that, um, so it'll be something referable. Bob Sturm, our old VP of engineering, actually wrote a blog post about this back in 2010 which I dug up, so you can always go back and refer to that. It's a nice little diagram about what this thing does, but um, I'll provide that. And, you know, I'll also provide, like, a DTS that, that is not like the one I built where, you know, I've got it being used as a lookup. I'll try to build one up that does it, like I said before, like, just throw it in as a, um, you know, a, a, a calculated variable or something and make sure that, that that works properly. There's no weird caveats there. Uh, but I'll, I'll spin that up and I'll put a, a blog out there. I'll probably do some other ones around performance and some best practices with some of this threading, but you know we're 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 getting there on this thing. It's it's a definitely a, a design principle we got to wrap our heads around a little bit more too because we're so ingrained with multi-threading and we've had to think outside the box for so many years on how to get other tactics involved. You mean on message queuing? Yeah, message yeah. queuing and then you know running workbenches in parallel and memory like. Yeah. We've done some stuff that we can do much more easily now. We just got to do it. Message queuing was always the answer for performance and how to get the fastest performance, yeah. but that's not the case anymore. And if you have a large-scale migration or initial sync you have to do, it might be better off to not use message queuing and use some of the um, bulk processing yeah. capability. For example, with whether it's Salesforce or CRM, there's absurd capability and there's bulk capability. And those can actually be faster than... Yeah, for sure. So we're gonna we're gonna do more of that. There's gonna be more content coming out, but but it's not out yet. <laughs> All right. All right. So uh, before we wrap it up, I just want to see if anybody else has any other questions or comments. Your mic should be open if you want to use them. You just have to unmute yourself from your end. All right then. Terrific. Oh, I got one. We got a question coming in. Hang on a sec. Question oh, I'm just, uh, thank you so much, guys. Okay. Oh, all right, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Anil. Thank you all for uh, taking the time out of your day. You know, some people in other time zones are, um, it's late in the day for you, so we appreciate you doing this after work hours very much. And hopefully some of you can make it to our, um, one of our yeah. uh, roadshow events or to the MVP events. We'll have some more information about those coming up, but I just wanted to get information about the dates out there so you'd have those as uh, soon as we could get them to you. All right. Thank you All right, very thank much. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks, guys.